All right, we're going to be in section 5.5, and we're going to be looking at uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors that have complex values. Before we can get into that, we need to talk about what are complex numbers. So the focus here is just defining what a complex number is and basic operations. So I'll go over the goals, define complex numbers, talk about different ways to represent a complex number, and then go over operations. These are the basic arithmetic and algebraic operations and we're going to define something called the complex conjugate. Um, so by the end of this, you should be able to use the square root of negative 1 to uh, work with complex numbers, to express them in different ways, and do the basic operations, and you should be able to do some basic algebra on complex numbers. Uh, so where do these come up? Uh, so if we just naively take a matrix and go to find the eigenvalues, what happens? So what's the idea here? Uh, the idea is I want to find the determinant a minus lambda i, set that equal to 0, and this will give me the characteristic polynomial. I want to find the roots of that parent polynomial. So what do I get? In this case, I'm going to get the determinant of 1 minus lambda 4 minus 2, 3 minus lambda. Let's see, that is going to give me 1 minus lambda times 3 minus lambda minus 4 times minus 2, and I'm going to set that equal to 0. And the idea is I want to solve that thing for lambda. So let's see, I'm going to FOIL that out. So I'm going to get 1 times 3, minus 3 times lambda, plus 1 times minus lambda, plus minus lambda squared. That should be quantity squared. This is going to be plus 8, 0. So I'm going to get lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 11 is 0. And I can't immediately see how to factor that, so let's just go to the quadratic equation. Minus a minus 4 for the b. Now this is going to be minus 4 squared. And I'm going to have minus 44, 4 times 11 times 1, all over 2 times 1. So what is that? going to be what 34 28 minus 28 over 2 Boy, okay so what do we do with this uh, what happens now if we have a negative number in the square root and that's going to be the, our focus now is how did we deal with that so let's see uh, key thing here is that uh, at one point in time people would have just stopped here and said that's not possible and moved on and then um, what happened is people like Gauss and Euler said you know this is just too useful to work with let's just go and run with it and see what happens and this whole area of mathematics opened up so we're going to define a number to be the square root of negative one so that thing right there, we're going to call that i. And what's important is that we're just going to call that a constant. And we're just going to define it to be the square root of negative 1. Um, and then if we have any real number multiplied by i, so for example 3i, we're going to call that an imaginary number. And if I have a number that's taking a real number plus a number times i, we're going to call that a complex number. So 5 plus 7i or 5 minus 7i, both of those are examples of complex numbers. And if a is 0, we get imaginary numbers. So the set of imaginary numbers are also complex numbers. One interesting result is Euler's formula, that e to the i t is equal to that. Again, remember, i is just a constant. Why is this? Um, Suppose I have a differential equation, y prime equals i times y, and when t equals 0, y is 1. I'm going to represent this as in this form, show that it's a solution. Represent it in this form, show that that's a solution. And since the solutions to differential equations are unique, for especially linear differential equations, they must be the same thing. So let's see. So if I have y equals e to the i t, y is 0, it's going to be e to the i times 0, anything times 0 is 0, so that's 1, so it satisfies the initial condition, 
and y prime, it's going to be e to the i t, and then by the chain rule, times the derivative of the exponent, a derivative of t is 1, that's a constant, so I just get that, and notice if that's my y, this is i times y, so this is a solution to this differential equation and satisfies that initial condition. Now suppose I do this. Suppose y is cosine of t plus i sine of t. If I plug in t equals 0, I get cosine of 0 plus i sine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. Sine of 0 is 0. 0 times i is 0. So that also satisfies the initial condition. What's the derivative? So this is going to be the derivative of cosine of t plus i sine of t. So derivative of cosine is minus sine of t. That's a constant. Derivative of sine is cosine of t. And I claim that this is i times y. Why is that? So i times y is i times cosine of t plus i sine of t. If I multiply the i through, I get i cosine of t plus i squared, so i times i, sine of t, but what? What do we have? i is the square root of negative 1, so if I square both sides, the square of the square root of something is just the something. So this thing right there is minus 1. So what does that give me? That gives me that i times y is, where is it? It's going to be i cosine of t minus sine of t. And that's what my y prime is. So uh, if y is that, i times y is that, and the derivative of y is that, so this satisfies the differential equation. So since this is a solution to the differential equation, so that solves the differential equation, this solves the differential equation with the same initial conditions, these two things must be the same function. Okay? So that gives us Euler's formula, which says e to the i t is cosine t plus i sine of t. And you may see other people write this as e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. It's exactly the same thing. The only difference here is that instead of saying theta, I'm calling it t. So there's no difference there. Okay, so that gives us Euler's formula, which is a huge result. Okay, so because of that, it turns out there's many ways to express a complex number. And what we can do is we can think of this as in terms of two dimensions. So we have the real numbers and the imaginary numbers. So if I go to A on the real line and B in the imaginary direction, I can think of A plus BI in this form. So this is oftentimes either called rectangular or Cartesian form. I can also write it in this way. So if I look at this figure here, let me redraw that. I have here. This is A. This height is B, so that means the distance from here to here is B. And so now that distance right there, that's some radius R. So we have what? R is the square root of A squared plus B squared for the Pythagorean theorem. If this is the angle theta for this triangle, so now we have a triangle like that. A is going to be r cosine theta. B is going to be r sine of theta. So this number right here, I can write, there's my a, there's the b. So those two numbers are exactly the same things. I'm just thinking about this the dis as the distance from the origin and the angle off the real axis. This is basically exactly the same thing as the polar form because if 
I look at that e to the i theta, I can use Euler's formula. This is going to be cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. Now I multiply that r through. And now this is exactly like the polar form. Okay, This is just a really nice compact way to talk about um, these things and makes it nice in terms of doing algebra and things. Okay.